So officially, we'll begin uh, day three of uh, uh, 2023 theoretical linguistics at KO and EMU, Linguistic and Scientific Inquiry Lecture Series number three, working toward the strong interpretation of SMT. So I'd like to welcome everyone. And this is a third day, so the format is, you know, as you know, like 60 minute uh, the lecture and 50 minute QA. And if more questions, and we can extend till uh, like a 90 minute framework. So uh, within 90 minutes, we have to finish. But so first, uh, Noam will give us a lecture. And as uh, we did last time, uh, Daniel will chair, and Asako and me will assist Daniel, and we'll begin. Uh, today, number three, lecture number three. So Daniel, could you begin? Yeah, thank you. So we're very happy to uh, open lecture number three. We've had our introduction to Noam, and I just wanted to thank him again for being here. So ladies and gentlemen, we turn the floor over to Professor Noam Chomsky, who will be continuing his discussion of the Miracle Creed and the Strong Minimalist Thesis. Noam? Okay. Uh... On Friday, I was trying to keep to what John Locke described as a modest endeavor. In his words, clearing the ground a little and removing some of the rubbish which lies on the way to knowledge. Actually, his term rubbish is unfair. A lot of what it covers is serious efforts to understand which have been shown to be misguided or inadequate, but have nevertheless laid the basis for proceeding to something new, maybe even something audacious, like the thesis that I language is an object of the natural world, like others, and satisfying the miracle creed, which in our case will mean approaching MST. Well, we can expect, or more accurately, we can hope that what we're discussing now will be removed as rubbish down the road, at least if the field is lucky enough to move towards John Wheeler's expectations for science, which I quoted last time. It's often pointed out that science builds on the accomplishments of earlier contributors. Also, quite commonly, on their errors made in attempts that opened up new problems and perspectives, but provided inadequate answers to them, inevitably. So let's move on to see how we might approach the goal of showing that Language is an object of the natural world, like others, specifically I language, an or organic object with the special follow properties that follow, like resource restriction, as Dan, Dan discussed on Wednesday. Uh, in proceeding, I'd like to presuppose familiarity with an article of mine that appeared in Gango Kenkyu in 2021 called Minimalism, Where Are We Now? And Where Can We Hope, uh, Where Can We uh, Hope to Go? I'll just refer to this as GK. And I'll be considering the same question as it looks to me, at least today, after a couple of years of collective rethinking of these issues. The term collective is spelled out in the acknowledgments of GK, includes Dan, Hisa, several others who've been working together for some years, an expansion of initiatives of our late friend and colleague, Sam Epstein. Well, we're pursuing two guiding principles. One is the principle S. And in th 
Uh, good. The computational structure should adhere as closely as possible uh, to the, uh, lost it somewhere. Can you send me back to the, okay. Uh, we're taking I language, pure language, to be a system generating thought. It's a traditional view, as I mentioned last time, seems increasingly well supported. Uh, several categories of thought are relevant to language structure and use. One category is propositional. We can understand that to include basic theta structure, as well as other semantic properties, such as subjective predication, matters to be clarified as we proceed. The second category of thought is clausal, Freudian force, information, discourse related, interrogative, topic, focus, scopal properties, so on. That's the familiar dichotomy called duality of semantics, corresponds roughly to the A, A bar distinction of standard theories, which was also adopted in GK, GK, but requires further analysis to which I'll return. Well, right at this point, doubts should surface. The clausal category is heterogeneous. It's pretty much everything else. So the question comes up whether this is the right way uh, to cut Cut to pie uh, seems questionable. And in fact, practice has not conformed to it, probably for good reasons that we may come to understand down the road. Practice has tended to cross cut these categories. WH structures have been treated along with propositional ones. Those are taken to be somehow core systems of thought as distinct from those that are more plausibly regarded as information and discourse related, like VP and AP raising, which also differ prosodically. They have special stress and pitch features, which are lacking in WH questions like, which book did he read? That has normal prosody like he read the book. In contrast, read the book, he never will, has special pro prosody and uh, a quite a different kind of interpretation. Uh, WH questions fall naturally together with propositional structures in many ways. And in practice, they've been treated that way. Uh, it reflects uh, an intuitive grasp on what's probably true in some sense that we haven't yet completely grasped. That's not just the way syntax has always been handled. Uh, taking WH questions to fall together with propositional structure is also reflected in cartoon and style semantics that takes the meaning of a WH question to be the set of true answers. Doesn't seem quite right for many reasons, but it may be pointing to an important truth. And it's just keeping this in mind as we proceed. Well, if I language is basically a thought generating system, it optimally should observe the principle T stands alongside of S, the miracle creed for language. So all relations and structure building operations, I'll just call them SBOs, are thought related with semantic properties interpreted at CI. And those are the two
basic principles. Well, we're exploring the optimal assumption that the primary structure building operation is merge. Particular case of binary set formation, it's now reinterpreted as an operation on workspaces along the lines that Dan discussed. If merge is available, then necessarily, so are its two logically possible subcases, external, internal merge. And notice that if only one of these is available, the system departs from SMT, doesn't make use of what's freely available. It's a stipulated deviation from optimality that would require some justification. Actually, that's worth some attention. There is a good deal of literature that seeks to show that merge evolved stepwise, beginning with external merge, faces a number of problems. One I just mentioned, uh, uh, it, it requires blocking one of the options. Furthermore, external merge is more complex than, than uh, external merge or internal merge, either of them is more complex than merge itself. It's merge plus the stipulation that one case is never used, or even more complex, maybe were used in some parts of grammar, but not others. And it's a curious proposal in other respects. Uh, internal merge is far similar, simpler than external merge. In fact, unboundedly simple, simpler. Uh, you can see this if you think of the process of carrying out merge. You pick something out of the workspace, then you have two choices. You can either pick a term of it and merge it, or you can construct a new object and then merge that one. Well, that second step can be of unbounded complexity. There's no limit on the scale and complexity of that second term. Uh, internal merge doesn't have that requirement. So if merge is to be complicated by barring one of its cases, the preference would be to bar external merge, which relates to another interesting line of thought. There actually is one option simpler than binary set formation. That's unary set formation. So let's imagine that such a, such a system exists. Suppose it takes the simplest form, one lexical item. Let's just call that one lexical item the numeral one. And for simply simplicity of computation, take the lexical item to be actually the set containing one. Apply internal merge, yields the successor function, as well as a very simple way to formulate the operation of addition that would not be available if external merge were used instead of internal merge. With a little bit of tweaking, you derive arithmetic, knowledge of arithmetic. Well, this might offer a solution to a problem that greatly vexed Charles Darwin and the co-founder of the theory of evolution, Alfred Russell Wallace. Uh, they didn't have the evidence, but they assumed correctly, it seems, that all humans have the capacity for arithmetic. But that raises a question, how could it have evolved? Obviously not by natural selection since the capacity was scarcely even used, if at all, through human history. Uh, Wallace thought there must be some unknown force in evolution beyond natural selection. Darwin resisted that idea, but had no alternative to suggest. Well, the answer might lie in what we've just been talking about. 
the same rewiring of the brain that yielded the faculty of language might have provided the arithmetical capacity as well as a very special case, latent for almost all of history, but present and actually manifested in language in a somewhat more complex form, binary versus unary. There is interesting work on this topic, also bringing in the musical faculty and even the faculty of moral judgment. The work was initiated by Leonard Bernstein in his Snorton lectures 50 years ago on music and language. Enterprise has since been joined by a number of others. It's been extended to the moral faculty by John Michael, later Mark Hauser, along with quite interesting experimental work. Well, one additional related aside is work by Marvin Minsky, one of the founders of artificial intelligence. Back in the 60s, he and one of his students explored the simplest Turing machines, just allowing them to run free. Almost all crashed. The few that survived yielded the successor function. Minsky speculated that evolution might have hit on the successor function if it had attained the capacity for Turing computability, recursive enumeration. That might relate to evolution of language along the lines we've been discussing. Well, Minsky was particularly interested in communication with extraterrestrial intelligence, if it exists. But he, he argued that if there ever will be contacts, the best way to start would be with the successor function, since the extraterrestrials would surely have evolved at least that. Well, so far, that's a dead end. It's called Fermi's Paradox. Where are they? Can't find them. The answer is nowhere, despite extensive efforts to find some trace of them for the past 70 years, quite sophisticated efforts in recent years, could turn out that humans really are the uniquest of all, maybe alone in the accessible universe, it's quoting Dobronsky. Well, uh, we might then ask why humans didn't keep to the simplest computational device, un unary set formation, arithmetical knowledge, relying on internal merge alone. Plausible answers, principle T. Language, language is a system of thought. Thought requires semantic relations. These in turn require external merge. Well, just one more diversion before returning to the main theme. What do we mean by semantic properties? That too merits some thought. Uh, there are earlier antecedents, but in the modern period, the term semantics has quite a definite meaning. It deals with the relation between symbols and the external world. It means the relations of reference denotation. That's semantics in the sense of Frege, Peirce, Tarski, Carnap, Quine, and others. That's why there are classic books with titles like Word and Object, Quine, or Words and Things, Roger Brown, one of the founders of modern psycholinguistics. There is, however, good reason to suppose that human language and thought have no such relations. There are, of course, acts of referring. These are actions, speech acts in John Austin's terms. But the act of referring is quite different from a relation of reference and doesn't presuppose it. That bears directly on how we understand 
the flourishing field of formal semantics. It's one of the liveliest areas of the study of language. So take, say, model theoretic semantics, postulates individuals and predicates. The models distribute the predicates over the individuals. The individuals are regarded as uh, things in the world, cats and dogs, bridges and houses, water and fire, so on. But the individuals in the model are not things of the world, and they don't have any simple relation to the world. They're internal symbols. They're very much like the symbols of phonetic representation. Perhaps they take some part in the actions of referring to the world, but that has to be shown. And it's no small task if it's even possible. Seems true of the Neo-Davidsonian event semantics that I brought up last time. Possible way of completing a full theory of language, imaginable at least. So how many events are there when someone walks across the room? I'm sure you remember there was a gentleman named Zeno who raised some problems about that. Fact is, events are mental constructions. They're suggested by things happening in the world, but uh, they're not part of the world. They'll, they're not part of the extramental world. Well, it's for reasons like these that I suggested that we regard formal semantics as part of syntax. It's a mode of symbolic manipulation. Hence, syntax in the field as it has developed since Frege and Peirce. Perhaps we can call it logical syntax, as Danny Fox once suggested. It's not a criticism of the work. It's rather a suggestion as to how it should be understood. May well turn out, I think it's quite likely, that language has syntax and pragmatics, but not semantics not in the modern standard sense of the concept. I'll refer to semantic properties, <clears throat> but in a looser, informal sense of the term. Semantics is just being meaning related in some sense. Okay, that's a lot of side tricks. Let's get back to the main theme, the principles S and T. We're assuming that the primary structure building operation is merge. Special case of binary set formation interpreted as a mapping on workspaces. Simplest possible operation consistent with the idea that I language is a system of thought. Two subcases of merge both yield semantic properties interpreted at CI. External merge yields the semantic properties of the propositional system. Internal merge yields semantic properties of the causal system. If so, merge satisfies S and T. So far, all seems pretty much okay, but not quite. There seems to be an unwanted disjunction in how merge functions. EM selects members that have been constructed in the workspace, but they have no theta roles. Internal merge applies only to theta structures. Well, principle T resolves the disjunction. Merge must be theta related no disjunction. There are, however, two ways in which it can be theta related. Either its domain or its range must be theta related, either its input or its output. Internal merge applies to a theta structure. External merge yields a theta structure. Well, let me toss in a note of caution again. Suppose it's true, as I suspect, 
that the right dichotomy is not propositional causal, but rather core versus non-core systems with WH questions falling together with the propositional category, but not say VP raising. Then external merge yields theta structures, while internal merge applies to the theta marked member of a theta structure. It's not quite perfect. And there are a few other loose ends to think about. Well, let's proceed. What about relations? Which kinds are legitimate? They should observe the guiding principles S and T. They should be as simple as possible and should be thought related with semantic properties. Well, the simplest relation is term of X. It involves only a single syntactic object, X relates it to one of its terms, satisfies S. It's the domain of internal merge, hence provides a way to link the propositional and clausal domain. Also operates phase internally, forming surface subject, object raising, each of them with semantic properties. So it also satisfies T. Next most simple operation is sisterhood. Form two objects in the workspace, merge them. That's the domain of external merge, yields the properties of the propositional domain. So it too satisfies T. The next most simple operation takes a theta structure, set of X and Y, relates one of them, let's say X to a term of the other. That's C command. It's the domain of IM along with other operations like anaphora, hence theta related satisfying T. These are all therefore admissible relations. They satisfy S and T. Furthermore, they're associated crucially with merge. If you think about it, there are no others satisfying these conditions. And it seems that language requires nothing more than these. Actually, other relations have been proposed over the years, like M command and the various proposed extensions of merge uh, introduce more complex relations. But there seem to be good reasons for rejecting all of these. And if that's so, the only relations in language are term of sisterhood and C command. The simplest ones, the only ones that are both theta and merge related. Well, as Dan discussed one important relation in human language is the relation copy, distinguishing copy pairs from repetitions. Simplest way to define the copy relation would be the two structurally related, structurally identical syntactic objects are related uh, if uh, our, our copy pairs if they're related by one of the three admissible relations. So let's assume the simplest definition. That's copy. You're related by an admissible relation. Well, the relation term of is excluded. A term of X cannot be structurally identical with X. The relation sisterhood is excluded by theta theory. Sisterhood is restricted by principle T to theta structures and a syntactic object cannot X say cannot be both theta marked and a theta marker. So what's left is C command. The optimal definition of copy effectively identifies C commanded pairs as copies. Uh, that conclusion seems to run afoul of cases like 
number one, yeah, many people arrived, many people is the copy, many people like many people. Well, these two, uh, can I come back? Uh, here we have an unaccusative A, number K, number A, and a, which is a copy pair, and a transitive B, which has two repetitions. But the two cases are structurally similar, C command in both cases. Actually, there have been a number of approaches to the problem over the years. I'll come back to what seems a simple principled answer. The copy repetition distinction has been a thorny issue for many years. You may be familiar by a paper by uh, Collins and Grote that uh, discusses many problems. It seems to have an optimal resolution in accord with the principles S and T. Uh, notice that there's no need to introduce a relation, a, an operation, form copy, in addition to merge. You can use it as a notational convenience, but you don't need another operation. Well, we've so far kept to the structure building operation merge, defined so as to satisfy S and T. There is, however, another configuration. It's provided free. That's unbounded set formation. Call it FS, formation of sets. FS is a costless operation available freely for all of inquiry. Hence, it's virtually never mentioned. The only way to avoid it is to keep to muriology. That's nominalism in the sense of Goodman and Quine. Actually, I did try that 70 years ago when I was a student of theirs. That's my first published article, but it's far too cumbersome. And there's no reason to be more pure than any of the sciences, or for that matter, ordinary discourse. So when we speak of, say, European Union or the planets, actually, we've been using FS, for example, in constructing the workspace and the lexicon. Well, let's assume, just for convenience, that a member of the lexicon becomes accessible to structure building operations only after it's inserted in the workspace. Merge selects its binary domain in the manner discussed in GK, Dan reviewed. FS selects n objects x1 to xn, each a member of the workspace, and it yields the set containing x1, x2, up to xn. Binary FS is distinct from merge in lacking its special organism-related and theta-related properties. FS with arbitrary n does appear in language, but in special ways. We'll return to it later on. Keep now to merge. Well, adhering to the third factor principle of minimal search, merge applies to members of the workspace, but not their terms. Select X, then Y forms the theta structure, set X, Y. Uh, the choice, if it's internal merge, the choice of Y is restricted. GK took only members of theta structures to be eligible. That's in accord with principle T. But in practice, it restricted attention to those that are theta marked. That may well be right for reasons that I mentioned. Let's tentatively keep to that picture. The standard view adopted in GK has been that there are three kinds of positions, A, A bar, and head positions. Correspondingly, three kinds of movement, A movement, A bar movement, head movement. Head movement here means raising of a head to a head position, 
not just raising of a head. Head movement is not properly formulable, and it seems that it can be eliminated along lines discussed in GK. I'll assume so. If so, that leaves A and A bar positions, A and A bar movement. Uh, these two are close, respectively, to external merge and internal merge, but they don't quite make it because of phase internal raising. Internal merge to surface subject and its VP analog object raising. Now, these operations have always been problematic. They've been called A movement, but they share some properties of standard A bar movement. Uh, let's put them aside for now, returning to them later when more fundamentals are in place. So for the core system, there's no need to distinguish between A and A bar positions, A and A bar movement. There's just internal and external merge satisfying duality. No complicated argument is needed for this. I'll continue to use the terms A and A bar, but only for convenience. Well, within the standard view, there's strong evidence that A and A bar movement must be segregated. Some of the evidence is reviewed in GK, not all of it, uh, but GK doesn't provides only a very loose and incomplete description of the distinction and how it's to be established. So let's take a look at the problems and ask then after that how they might be resolved in a principled way. So take the sentence two. It's impossible for John to understand this book. Okay, back to me. Uh, we can question this book forming three. Guess to avoid verb raising. Guess which book it's impossible for John to understand. Uh, that's okay. Uh, we cannot, uh, we can, uh, generation of three proceeds by internal merge of which book to the specifier of the bracketed clause for John to understand, then goes on to the matrix position, what's called the criterial position in Luigi Ricci's sense. But internal merge can't raise which book from the specifier of the clause, the bracketed clause, to the subject position, which would yield which book is impossible for John to read. That's a standard case of improper movement. Number four, which book is impossible for John to read? Well, let's take a more interesting case. Consider our old friend, easy to please. There's been a long debate about whether the surface subject raises from the clausal complement. Uh, this has to do now with English type languages. There are other types that Mark Baker and Lisa Travis have discussed, but in English type languages, the complement can be arbitrarily complex as in sentence five, uh, Pavarotti, if you can put up five, Pavarotti is easy for people who think that they might enjoy the operas that Mozart composed to really appreciate T. That's uh, five. Well, you take a look at the complement, has the properties of a bar movement. That means that something was raised from the position mark T to the specifier of the complement. One possibility is that what is raised is Pavarotti. Then it's raised further to the surface subject. 
that would be a case of improper movement, but it must be barred, as we can see from such examples as number six. So 6A, someone stole many books from the library. B, many books were stolen, trace from the library. Many books are easy to steal, trace from the library, trace for the base position from which it raises. Well, both A and B mean basically there's a thief on the loose. In B, T marks the copy in the reconstruction position left by internal merge. I'll come back to the details of that, but we understand it. That indicates that interpretation is the same in A and in B. Example C has quite a different meaning. It means that some category of books, maybe history books, are easy to steal from the library. T, again, is a copy left by internal merge, but it's not internal merge of many books. That's clear from the interpretation, differs from the raising case B. The alternative approach, which provides the right interpretation, is that an empty element, call it E, in the base position raises to the specifier of the bracketed complement. It's interpreted as an empty operator that leaves an open sentence, functions as a predicate, theta marks the externally mar merged inserted subject, which is actually in the same position as the predicate internal subject in John Saw Bill. It's later raised surface subject. Well, that's evidently the right analysis. Uh, again, we see that there can be no improper movement from a raised element in the clausal domain to an A position in the propositional domain that C commands it. That requires some kind of segregation. Well, what's true of raising also holds of the copy relation. A phrase in subject position, surface subject position, cannot enter into a copy relation with the spec, spec of the bracketed clause, even though it C commands it. So take, for example, the topicalization structure seven. Well, I was saying that a phrase in subject position can't enter into the copy relation with the specifier of the bracketed clause, like seven, John, John really dislikes. Uh, the sentence is okay, but uh, the two occurrences of John are repetitions, not copies. Why is this connecting? Uh, so they're repetitions, not copies. Along the way, the derivation yields the uh, uh, structure number eight. John, John Riley really dislikes John, where the second John is deleted. Here, uh, the uh, subscripts are just for uh, exposition. They don't mean anything. So in eight, uh, John number one, C commands, John number two, and they're structurally identical. But if the copy relation holds, then clearly the wrong interpretation results. Well, the problem extends further if you carry the derivation on, yields the full sentence, nine. Uh, here, a bold face uh, indicates the elements that are involved in the topicalization operation. Uh, I won't read it, you can see it. Here, John four, 
see commands structurally identical, John 1. The pair are therefore copies should receive the same interpretation. Furthermore, John 1 should delete under externalization by the usual rule so that the, and in fact, John 1, C commands John 2, so John 2 should delete. So what you would end up under externalization by the usual rule is number 10. John really dislikes, obviously, completely wrong. Same is true with such sentences as 11. Uh, most people, most people regard most people as foolish. Uh, it's supposed to come out. Most people, most people regard as foolish, but that requires canceling C command from uh, an element to the next to the next higher one, whether it's move or copy. So in short, neither move nor copy can relate the surface structure to the A bar position that they see command that would mix propositional and plausible structure. Now the two structures have to be linked once they create the same derivation. That can be done by free internal merge to specifier of the lowest phrase. Otherwise, they have to be segregated. The one legitimate case of internal merge does leave a copy, which provides the theta rule, deletes in externalization in the normal manner, but successive cyclic movement does not copy and delete in the same way that suggests that it just does not exist. Well, notice I've ignored structural case in assuming structural identity. Actually, the examples can be complicated slightly so that question doesn't arise. But more generally, it seems to me likely that structural case is a feature of externalization, not I language. It doesn't reach CI where it would be uninterpreted. Actually, that opens a lot of interesting questions that I'll put aside and carry us afield. Well, all of these problems, there's many more like them, arise from the standard assumption adopted in GK that A bar structures are derived by successive cyclic movement. If that's the case, some strong form of segregation must be imposed to ensure that the clausal and propositional systems do not interact. To ensure somehow that A and I bar systems are entirely distinct apart from the free rule that moves from the propositional A system to the clausal A bar system. Uh, well, that matter isn't discussed as far as I know in standard theories. It's brought up in GK, uh, some examples, not enough, and without an adequate formulation of segregation, which is actually not so simple. Notice, these problems would completely disappear if successive cyclic movement is simply eliminated and the properties it seeks to capture are handled in some other way. Well, let's look into that. Actually, that wouldn't be too surprising. Let's take a look at uh, uh, A movement, what we call A movement. The issues are intricate. Uh, Howard has discussed many of them, many complications, but there are plausible grounds discussed in GK to suppose that there's no successive cyclic A movement. Well, suppose that's the case. If so, would not be unexpected that A bar movement would work the same way. 
So let's look further and see how that might work. So take a look at 12. Which book did you read? Which book? Internal merge raises the object, uh, which book, to the specifier of the verb phrase in which it appears. That's free operation, which shifts from the propositional to the clausal domain, forms a copy pair, lower element deletes under externalization, provides the theta marking. Well, the basic problem properties of the propositional domain do not hold in the clausal domain. Particular theta theory doesn't hold. So accordingly, the bracketed uh, raised object in 12, which book doesn't have any theta rule. Under principle T, merge is theta related. In particular, Internal merge applies only to theta structures. Well, which book is not on a theta structure? So it follows that merge cannot, in fact, that whole structure is not a theta structure. So it follows that merge cannot apply to that structure, can't apply to the raised object. There can't be any successive cyclic A bar movement. We had principal reasons for establishing that. And it does happen to yield the desired conclusion. Uh, that gets rid of segregation. No need to talk about it. There's no further interaction between the A and A bar system, between the propositional, the clausal domains. The problems disappear. Well, just for convenience of exposition, nothing more than that. Let's say that the raised object is placed in a box, inaccessible to merge and to operations of the propositional system, uh, separated from the ongoing derivation. The boxed element must, however, be accessible to that derivation at later phases for interpretation at the interface and for continuing the derivation. Well, GK maintained the standard assumption that the element moves phase by phase to the spec of the phase where it's interpreted at CI, enters into the derivation to continue, eliminated at SM if externalization is activated. Now there's no element movement. But the boxed element is accessible at the phase level. That means at every phase, the head of the phase consults the boxed element to determine the interpretation at that point of the derivation. Well, take a full overt movement language like English. In that case, uh, uh, for, uh, not spell out, but the, the uh, presentation of the raised element is at the of the boxed element as at the matrix position, criterial position. It's where scope is also determined. That's where it enters into the derivation. There can be non-trivial effects at intermediate positions. It's a matter discussed quite extensively in the subjacency literature, come back to a couple of cases. If you skip a phase, use a subjacency violation. I'll come back to illustrations and elaboration. Well, one last point. Notice that the boxed element, though it's not part of a theta structure, it, the boxed element, which is not part of a theta structure, is therefore immune to merge. However, the, inter the interior of the boxed element may well include theta structures. So take a sentence like 13, of which presidents did you wonder how many pictures the gallery was planning to sell? 
many sentences like that. The bracketed phrase is boxed. It's in the clausal domain. But the internal phrase, pictures of which presidents, is a theta structure. So internal merge can form 13 raises from the theta structure, just as in 12. That fits easily into the picture just outlined of consultation of the boxed element. Well, the condition on accessibility at later phases can be simplified. The specifier of a phase is accessible at the phase level. It can be a boxed element formed by the operation internal merge that carries you from propositional to clausal structure. But it could also be an element that's just merged by external merge in a theta position. So predicate internal subject, for example, that's theta marked, it's part of a theta structure, can therefore be raised to phase internal subject position. Also its VP counterpart, object raising. So we can simplify uh, the, the thing, not just referring to boxed elements, just saying specifier with a phase. Uh, simplification yields highly specific outcomes, sign that we may be on the right track well, uh, next topic is surface subjects. Maybe I'll hold that off until next time. Okay, good. Thank you, Noam. There is... Let me see if I can get myself organized here. Oh, here I am. Okay. Sorry, I have to switch computers in a complicated way. Okay, thank you. So there's a round of applause, I see. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, so let's open the floor for any questions. And I just want to... Uh, Howard, I think that's a hand up rather than an applause hand. Howard, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Dan, and thanks, Noam. A um, couple of... Uh, uh, questions or comments about what uh, in the old days we used to call tough movement. Um, one uh, question is about uh, your example four, Noam. Which book is impossible for John to read? Um, uh, which, uh, if I understood you, you claimed it was bad and that follows from your theory. To my ear, it sounds perfect, just like the non WH analog of it. This book is impossible for John to read. Was I misunderstanding your point? The book is in, the book is impossible for me to read. Yeah, it sounds fine to is, me. Hence, the WH analog is also fine. <laughs> no good for you. No good for me. Huh. I have to leave it at that. Huh. Interesting. Standard case of him, of uh, uh, improper movement. So what about which book is impossible to read? Which book is impossible to read? That's fine. Which book is impossible for John to read? Yeah. It has to be. Mm -hmm. well, See, uh, Fiango and I, Fiango and I, Fiango and I in our 1974 paper discussed. I mean, if it's, if it's, uh, if it's good, what that would mean is there's no, phase boundary at the uh, bracketed phrase. For me, there's a phase boundary. If there's yeah. no phase boundary, you just raise it. Yeah, in effect. Uh, yeah. John is likely to be here. See, see in effect, Fiango and I argued uh, for pretty much that. We said that uh, uh, examples like it's impossible for John to read this book are structurally ambiguous. The four John might be a complementizer in a subject, and then our conclusion was yours. You couldn't do the extraction. But on the other hand, the four John could just be a prepositional phrase, and then there's no bar to the extraction. 
Could be. That's yeah. an analysis in which there's no phase boundary. Right. Yeah. Oh. So it's basically the same point, but there would be an option as to whether there's a phase or not. Yeah. Right. If there's a phase, it's out. If there's no phase, it's not out. Yeah. Then that... where you're interpreting the four mm -hmm. phrase. Exactly. Yeah. That was the the in the lower part or the higher part. Right. If right. you're interpreting in the lower part, there's a phase. Yeah. If you're interpreting in the higher part, there isn't. No. Yeah. We ought to be able to find an example that distinguishes it. The, there are examples that about, distinguish it. Uh, the book is impossible for John, for Bill to read. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. That yeah. forces the phase. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's a better example because yeah. it forces the phase boundary. Yeah. But your point is, your point's quite correct. There's an ambiguity right. about where you interpret the four phrase. Right. You interpret it up above, which case there's no phase boundary. Yeah. You can interpret it down below, which case there is a phase boundary. And we settle the issue by just putting it in both places. Right. And that forces the phase boundary. Good. That's a good right. trick. Yeah. Yeah. Fiango and I, of course, didn't have phase technology, yeah. but the point we were making I was myself, the same. If you don't yeah. mind to correct that. Yeah. Um, then uh, also, also with respect to, you know, tough movement, just a historical. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay. A, uh, a historical observation also going back to uh, Lasnik and Fiango, 1974. Um, so uh, a pair of example, like a pair you gave, uh, uh, something like uh, many demonstrators uh, would be likely to be arrested, where the many demonstrators can be understood as having low scope, versus many demonstrators uh, uh, would be easy to arrest, where it only has high scope. Fiango and I gave pairs exactly like that to argue against the classic, what we now call a movement analysis of tough movement. <laughs> We said if we're a movement, then you should get the reconstruction that you get with raising, but you don't. Hence, it must be base generated up high. <laughs> must be generated. Yeah, that's the same. Right. The same point. The term tough movement, which was Hadge's term, is actually wrong. That's right. It, movement. Yeah. it can't be movement because that would be improper movement. So tough movement is non-movement. It's... Uh, an example of a subject internal predicate where the predicate happens to be an open clause. So mm -hmm. they're predicate. So, right. So the term tough movement ought to be banned. Yeah. From oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Think, I, what I was see, saying I, at the beginning. Yeah. This yeah. was a step forward when Hedge made it. But very often, steps forward turn out to be wrong. They oh. open up new problems, pursue them further. You find new things you never thought about. Yeah. Yeah, that was essentially the point uh, Fiango and I were trying to make 50 years ago. <laughs> I see. Good. I'm remaking it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Noam, if I could just ask you quickly about the last example that you had, um, just a clarif uh, clarification question. If an object, WH phrase, moves to the specifier of little v star p then it is in effect boxed and so you get extraction out of it higher up if that same wh noun phrase is externally merged into the specifier of v star p it's the external argument it's also uh visible to higher phases so why can't you extract out of that? Do we get the subject-object asymmetries with WH extraction? That raises interesting questions about raising from subject. Topics I was going to talk about. A language is just apparent. First of all, there are cases, even in English, where you can raise from the subject. So if you have... Uh, Uh, let's take of which presidents were pictures on sale. If you go back to the paper on phases, uh, 2008 or so, uh, 
there is a distinction made between extraction from subject when it's a passive or when it's an active. They seem to differ. I probably won't remember. So of which presidents? Yeah, I remember. Those are the on phases. It was an accident, yeah. let's say, is much worse than of which, that's not a great sentence, but sentences like that, much worse than of which presidents were pictures on sale. And the active passive, this is actually a point that goes back to a paper of Sam Goodman's and John Frampton's where they made that distinction. And uh, there's a discussion of it in on phases, uh, arguing that the extraction comes from a different position. But in those cases, English does have fair extraction from subjects. Uh, actually, some languages seem to have it freely. I don't know if Rini's here, but Dennis Ott says, told me that in German and Dutch, they're free extraction from subject. I think that Japanese allows this. Uh, he uh, ought to be able to tell me, but, uh, or Mamoru, if he's here. But it's, it seems to me very, rather weak. The uh, subject adjunct distinction doesn't seem to be a single generalization. That was Jim Huang's distinction, but it seems to break up into two cases with extraction from subject being much more easily available and some languages apparently free. And just and just quickly, if if I can follow up on that, if we combine Howard's arguments about the optionality of object raising with the analysis that you're presenting here, don't we get a prediction that in the cases where you're not raising the object, you shouldn't be able to extract from it because it's not going to be in the spec of the face head. But in the cases where you do raise it, you should be able to extract. Yeah. Uh, I have to ask Howard about that. These examples are so subtle that you have to have pretty sophisticated judgments about <laughs> yeah. whether, whether they're even possible. But I don't know. I don't know if it's possible to tell. But I think yeah. that 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 is a that is a a prediction of the of the theory, though. That might, it might is be a prediction. Worth, yeah. yeah, might be worth looking into. Yeah, the examples are uh, quite subtle. I've suggested on occasion that things actually go exactly the other way around. <laughs> when you have done the object shift, the thing becomes an island. And when you haven't, you can extract out of it. But yes, I, I concede the uh, judgments are quite subtle. <laughs> yeah, that's a very interesting question. I mean, one issue, actually, Howard has a long, detailed discussion of this. But uh, one question is why the optionality? I mean, it should be the same as raising the surface subject, right? But which is not op which is not connected to EPP, but otherwise not optional. Uh, I mean, it's optional for null subject languages. But why is? But this is a different kind of optionality. I mean, for null subject languages, raising to spec of infill is just free, you do it or not. But in the object raising cases, there seem to be maybe dialect differences or something of the style differences. And then the question is, what's determining it? Well, one possibility which has been discussed uh, is it's determined by optionality of labeling. If you label, you have an XP, YP structure, so from one perspective, it's unlabelable, like a small clause in Morrow's analysis. But from another perspective, it could be labeled by the head, by the head of the whole construction. In that case, it would be not necessary to move it. So maybe that option is kind of available dialectically. You could say the same about uh, necessity of raising of external uh, as predicate internal subject. Uh, for, it's partly connected to EPP, but some languages allow it to be more freely in situ. I think Japanese is one 
German is supposed to be one. These are very interesting and, as Howard said, quite subtle questions. Okay, other uh, questions? Lisa? Yes, I have a clarification question. Um, so the simple case, which book did you read? Um, in, in the box theory, which book raised to the lower phase I am, and then boxed. So the box, which book, you know, boxed element at the you know, VP phase, uh, there is no further I am. So in fact, uh, this which book is actually interpreted at the CP level, uh, but never I am to CP. That is, is that correct? So only once uh, which book moves to I am to the uh, edge of little VP and then box. And then the box element is accessible to higher uh, C phase and then gets interpreted, actually externalized at that place and also interpreted for the scope interpretation uh, uh, at the C level, but never I am to C. And the transcription is not working too well. Are you asking whether yeah, I'm asking, yeah, element, I'm, the, first, the legitimate first raising if yeah, the first hmm. internal to small v? Well, my question is just uh, WH phrase internally merged to the phase, lower phase edge and then boxed. Yeah, goes to the phase edge. Yeah. yeah, and then boxed and never undergo I am but interpreted at sea level because it is accessible at the sea. Interpreted, I'll go into this in detail. It can be interpreted at every phase. Every phase. Okay. There are cases where it's interpreted at every succeeding phase. Depends on the language. And even in English, there are cases that are, I'll come to, they're talked about in the Miracle Creed paper where you just dissociate. Uh, the interpret the uh, uh, introducing it into the derivation at the top fa phase, but interpreting an afra in the middle in a middle phase, and interpreting the uh, theta structure at the lowest phase it seems to be possible to dissociate them completely. Yeah. Again, mildly subtle examples, but they seem pretty clear. I'll come back to these next time. Well, one uh, follow-up question. Is, the same shows up in uh, just externalization, like in these German dialects yeah. where you just raise the WH phrase once and then you have a marker up above for every succeeding phase. Okay. So boxing effect is in fact the result of I am? Is an automatic effect of I am, are you assuming? So every IEM object is in fact yeah. boxed. Uh, don't take the boxing too seriously. That's an okay. exposition. It's a way of referring easily to the fact that what's raised by internal merge uh, uh -huh. is, uh, does, is not part of a theta structure. Okay. But at this point, Easy we are not... say that is it's boxed, but it's just part of the definition. It's okay. it, It's essentially what's giving us the old fact that internal merge goes to a, a, to not, to a non theta position. Uh, it's here, we're not saying it, it's just kind of coming out automatically. Okay, thanks. So isn't it the case that there are two notions? One is eligibility and one is visibility. Once a noun phrase moves to a non theta position, it's no longer eligible for merge. But once a noun phrase moves to the specifier of little v star position, then it's no longer eligible for merge, but it remains visible for higher phases. But if I merge to spec of infill, for example, that's a noun phrase that's not eligible anymore for merge, but also at higher phases, it's going to be invisible because 
it's inside the phase and it's not in this position, namely spec of little v star p that's going to be visible for the higher phases. It's not, it doesn't, it, there are two totally different notions, you're right. What we call el el eligibility in, say, the merge paper uh, was basically saying if something's theta mark, you can raise it. So you can't raise a head, for example. Uh, but, uh, and basically, we're also saying you can raise theta marker, but theta mark, mark, marking things like VP, but that's a basically different operation. So, yes, we want to distinguish that. What we were calling eligibility, we now just say the theta marked element is accessible to merge. However, once it raises to the causal domain, it's not accessible to merge anymore. Because in the proper in the causal domain, you don't have any of the properties of theta marking. So it can't be theta marked, period. You move into the causal domain, you've abandoned all properties of the propositional domain, no more theta marking. So when it moves into the causal domain, which is the one thing that it does, in fact, then it's not accessible, it's not uh, eligible for merge. It's just like something that moves into spec infill is not accessible to merge because it doesn't have a theta role. Uh, but it is the element that determines how what, what interpretation is at every succeeding phase. And that's what replaces successful cyclic movement. And in fact, it will actually enter the derivation later on at the matrix position. And it must enter the derivation, as you can see from the cases, like I think it was 13, where you can extract from it once it's reached that position. So Takanori, did you have your hand up before? I just want to make sure we didn't lose lose oh. you. Oh, yeah. uh, I'm wondering uh, how the uh, principle uh, T uh, is related to the notion of free merge. It's, it's uh, seems like that uh, and the principle of T uh, or duality of semantics it, uh, is uh, incompatible with uh, the notion of free merge uh, if uh, application of merge is severely constrained uh, by uh, seat theory uh, or uh, something like that. Uh, the notion of free merge is uh, totally uh, dispensed with. Unfortunately, Life transcription doesn't like deviations from standard English. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not getting Sorry. very clear. Are you asking whether merge is, happens to be constrained in many ways, but that's for other reasons. It's a free operation, nothing to say. However, there are principles like S and T and their consequences which are going to limit the cases where it'll apply. Because in some cases, when you apply it, you'll violate S and T. Uh, also, there is a part of T, uh, the semantic part of T. S is the compositional part. T is the semantic part. One of the semantic parts of T, a crucial part, is that there are two quite distinct uh, domains of semantic interpretation. Now, it just goes back to Aristotle, actually, Frege had a version of it. There's the propositional structure, and uh, then there's the rest, uh, force, uh, uh, information, discourse. And then there's this cross-cutting case of WH movement which I mentioned, which is tr formally, it looks as if it belongs in the clausal structure, but semantically, 
And even in the way it behaves in the syntax, it works together with the propositional structure. That's the point I mentioned at the beginning. But if I understand your point correctly, merge itself is completely free, but other conditions come along and they limit the way in which it can be, uh, in, which, in which it can happen. So if merge, internal merge carries you from the propositional to the clausal domain, then it's in the clausal domain it's no longer in theta structures, hence can't be merged. Though part, internal parts of it can be merged, they'll still have theta structures. Now, I'm not sure I captured your question correctly, but if not, let's try again. Okay, thank you very much. Oh. Hey, Howard? Uh, yeah, a, uh, just a quick follow-up on Daniel's question, or maybe a much more simple-minded version of Daniel's question. What's the derivation of which book do you like? <laughs> Has which book merged to spec of VP and then further merged to spec of C or not? The, first, the lowest phase, let's take John. John read a book. Yeah. Okay. The lowest phase is read a book, right? VP store. So the first merge uh, in the old system, the first movement would be to spec a VP store. Mm -hmm. Here, that much is the same. There's one difference. Once you move to the spec of VP store, you've gone from the propositional domain to the clausal domain, not theta marked anymore. Isn't theta marked in the old system? In the, uh, that solves a problem that I'll come back to uh, next time. But if you think about it, spec of the phase can either be external merge or IM. And in the successive, in the standard theory, that's kind of problematic because there's no way to tell. Well, here we have a way to tell. I'll come back to it. If it's internally merged, it's in another domain altogether. Externally merged, it stays in the propositional domain. Now notice that these two, two domains do, they don't interact in terms of merge, copy, and other operations of the syntax, but they are interrelated. So at every higher phase, you're consulting the element in spec position for the lower phase, determining what to do. And at the matrix position for English, different other languages, but in a full uh, WH movement language like English, at the matrix position, the whole content of what you originally merged enters into the derivation and is then available for further actions, for further operations of merge in its interior, like example 13 towards the end. I think all of this, I think it keeps to about the simplest assumptions, assuming there are some, some fixed assumptions, language specific assumptions. One of them is that there are two types of semantics. That's a language specific assumption. There's proposition, and things like force. And then there's this interesting problem, which hasn't been discussed, but should be, about why WH movement works together with the propositional, though it looks like the clausal. We're, we're right up against our 90 minute hard deadline, but I see that uh, Emilio has his hand up and I just wanna make sure you have a chance to ask your question. Oh, um, yeah, uh, I, thanks. I'm just going to repeat the question from the previous lecture when it was suggested that I hold it for these lectures. Um, the question was about FC or copy formation and how is it, it's implicit in the same sense as the labeling operation, or does the fact that it fall out of the simplest relations that result from merge sisterhood term or C, or C command, particularly C command in this case, 
Um, Not quite. I understand. Yeah. Labeling is a process. There is a process of labeling. And there has to be a means to explain how the process works. So maybe it's along the lines of the labeling theory that I'm kind of tacitly accepting here, the one from the 2013, 2015 papers. But there has to be a problem. Form copy, we can just forget about. There's no need to introduce it. It's a notational convenient. In the earlier versions, it was necessary to have a rule. It played an important role in GK and in earlier discussions. But if you look at it in terms of the consequences of the simplest relations, pure, just keeping to S, principle S, just keep to the simplest relations, then all we have to say is that if, if X and Y are related, they're copies, period. No need to say anything else. Turns out that that'll just be C command because of other factors that I mentioned. But basically, we just have to say simplest possible thing. X and Y are related, they're copies. No need to say anything else. And relation is a fundamental notion. We do have relations. And the relations, it seems, pretty strikingly, are restricted to the three simplest ones. So you go back over the history, things like M command were proposed, which go beyond the three simplest ones. But it seems that we can get around it. And if you look at the extensions of merge, parallel merge, the rest of them, they introduce all kinds of relations beyond these. But as Dan mentioned in last Wednesday, it seems we can eliminate those. So if so, it would mean that language, specifically I language, just yeah. uses the simplest possible uh, relations that meet condition T, which would be the perfect outcome if it works. And it's something to be explained, like, why don't we have other relations? Okay, so I think we're uh, right at the limit. So thank you very much, Noam. Um, appreciate it. Okay, there's a nice round of applause. I'm not sure you can hear it, but I will give you that. There's a nice round of applause. Noam, thank you very much. So we'll see you on Wednesday night. The right. Okay, great. So thanks, everyone. Good night and good morning, and we'll see you on Wednesday. Thank okay. you. All right. We're hereby adjourned. <laughs>